Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the lecture session 6 on uh, forced convective heat transfer. In the previous lecture session, we had uh, solved some numerical examples on external flow forced convective heat transfer. Now let us take up the internal flow uh, forced convective heat transfer problem. Before we start our discussion on internal flow, so it's better to um, appreciate some uh, typical applications of internal flow problems. Uh, you can find many uh, applications uh, per se uh, for internal flow situation. So some common and typical examples uh, you can quote are um, you can visualize a evaporator or a boiler wherein you will have these uh, tubes through which uh, water will be flowing and uh, on the outer surface of the tubes you might uh, have flue gases which are being uh, circulated. So this hot flue gas will transfer heat to the fluid uh, which is flowing inside. So this is a very typical example of a internal flow uh, convective heat transfer problem. Similarly, uh, it's not only um, cross sections which are circular uh, in nature. So you can also have a rectangular cross section if you are familiar with um, HVAC. So air conditioning ducts if you have seen. So you will find that they are rectangular in cross section. And this is also a very good uh, example of internal flow uh, forced convective heat transfer problem. So uh, there you will be circulating cold air uh, through these ducts uh, throughout your uh, building. So this is one uh, very frequently observed application of internal flow problem. So here our main focus will be uh, similar to what we dealt with in the external flow problem. So we will try to uh, find out what is the value of the Nusselt number for an internal flow problem. So this is our uh, main focus. Um, as we have already seen uh, through the discussion of external flow problems, we will also bring in aspects of velocity distribution and uh, how it affects uh, the convective heat transfer uh, situation. Okay. One more thing that I want to uh, put forth in the start itself is, so if you recall the derivation of uh, the governing equations uh, uh, that we did in the class were in Cartesian coordinate system. Okay. So as I pointed out, there are many applications of internal flow wherein the cross section is circular. So for a circular cross section, you are um, you should inevitably go with the cylindrical coordinate system or the polar coordinate system. So in the class, uh, we have just noted down the final forms of the conservation laws in cylindrical coordinate system. We have not derived it uh, completely. And also the mathematics required there is slightly more involved. I don't say it is uh, tough or easy compared to the Cartesian system. It's slightly uh, uh, involved. So we'll see uh, uh, to that later. So that's why what we will do is I'll start uh, with a Cartesian system itself, Cartesian internal flow system. We will develop all the uh, requisite fundamental concepts uh, that are required to explain the physics of the problem. Later, we will extend it to the cylindrical coordinate system and uh, uh, conclude our discussion. So this is the framework of the entire uh, discussion that we will be having. Okay. Uh, as I pointed out, so it is important that we uh, understand the basic uh, uh, fundamental principles which govern the physics of this problem. And there are some concepts uh, which are required to explain this. So let us start with these uh, foundational concepts and later let us extend it to uh, the actual problem. Let us proceed to the actual problem and solve for the Nusselt number. Okay. The first important concept that we will be discussing is of fully developed flow. Okay. So as you know that uh, you can divide uh, your problem analysis into 
two things one is which deals with the velocity distribution and the other one is which deals with heat transfer so the velocity portion is referred to as hydrodynamics and the heat transfer portion is heat transfer analysis okay so velocity boundary layer so we will uh, uh, refer it to by the name of hydrodynamically uh, fully developed flow the development of the velocity boundary layer we will uh, uh, use the term hydrodynamically fully developed flow in this uh, uh, concept okay as i mentioned we will consider a cartesian system so i have considered a cartesian coordinate uh, system arrangement here we have two parallel plates and uh, the width of these plates are such that uh, it is very large compared to the distance between the plates which is 2h since w is very large than 2h so what is the simplification it brings to your problem is the z coordinate will become uh, negligible the variation along the z coordinate need not be considered so it uh, the problem effectively becomes a two dimensional problem along x and y okay so this assumption is not um, even though it seems a very ideal assumption but for cases when you have uh, a very large width compared to the uh, distance between the plates so you can easily assume it uh, to be a parallel plate channel which is what it is referred to and you can solve the problem in two dimension uh, system only okay so the development of the hydrodynamic boundary layer is shown in this uh, sketch so it's not uh, qualitatively different from the external flow uh, situation so only thing here is you are have you will be having two plates instead of one plate uh, let me draw that here instead of having uh, one plate over which your boundary layer develops now you have two plates a top plate and a bottom plate and you will have a simultaneous development of boundary layer it is important to note that this entire flow is symmetrical about the center line. It is symmetrical about the uh, axis. So this is very important. It simplifies the mathematical analysis of the problem. Okay. So you have the boundary layers which will develop on both plates. And finally, after some distance along X, after this distance that is so you are both uh, velocity boundary layers will merge at the center line okay so as shown in the figure now there are some uh, points that you should uh, uh, discuss here one is okay so in external flow problem so you had something called as a free stream velocity so if you recall your external flow uh, situation, I'll draw it here. So you have the velocity above the boundary layer, you took it as V infinity. So which was the free stream uh, velocity. So in an internal flow problem, there is nothing called as a free stream velocity. Or to put in another, uh, in other words, so you don't consider U infinity as the reference velocity so you don't have uh, a reference velocity like u infinity okay so why what is the reason for that so what is the velocity at this point so because of the no slip uh, boundary condition you know that the velocity here is zero that is both your u and v components are both zero at the wall at the wall both the velocity components are zero okay so what is the effect of that you know that this boundary layer forms and the velocity inside this boundary layer is less compared to velocity here when you compare the velocity in this region and when you compare the velocity here so you can easily recognize that the velocity here is less than velocity here okay so the central region that you are seeing where you have a uniform profile of velocity the central region where you have the uh, one second 
the uniform velocity profile this one this region okay so you can see that the velocity profile is a straight line so it is uniform so this region is called as the core it is referred to as the core region and this is your boundary layer a region so velocity here velocity here is less than velocity here okay so that means you have this variation of velocity throughout the cross sections okay and there is another important factor that you should understand so if i take these two cross sections let me say this is uh, one and this is two what is this what is the magnitude of this velocity the diagram i have drawn here is not to scale please uh, excuse me so i want to know if i call this as uh, velocity as uc1 and this as uc2 when you compare these two are they same no they cannot be same which one is greater is uc1 greater or uc2 greater so if you look into the uh, variation of the velocities here you can see that a larger region of the flow is affected by viscosity so the viscous effects are affecting a larger part of the area compared to this don't you agree so what is the effect of this is in order to compensate for this reduction in velocity and you know that the uh, flow rate the flow rate should be constant you cannot have a different flow rate here and a different flow rate here your continuity will not be satisfied so if you want to maintain this uh, flow rate as a constant so what is flow rate if you take the volumetric flow rate it is area into velocity so if this is to be uh, if larger area is affected by reduction in velocity obviously uc2 should be more compared to uc1 why because here larger uh, area is affected by uh, reduction in velocity to compensate for that and to maintain a constant flow rate so your uc2 should increase more than uc1 okay so if you observe this phenomenon will continue until uh, your uh, boundary layers merge so until this point you will have this effect so when you compare the velocity here here if you go on along the x direction so until the flow reaches this point wherein both your boundary layers merge you will have an increase in velocity at the center so ultimately when it when both the boundary layers merge you will have this a seizure of this effect okay so with this premise let us proceed to the next slide and see what are the important points that we can note about this fully developed flow okay yeah so now the hydrodynamic boundary layers develop on each plate or uh, and after some distance along x they merge with each other the viscous effect now penetrates throughout the cross section so the when the boundary layers merge the meaning is the entire uh, uh, cross section is now under the effect of viscosity in the previous uh, distribution here if you consider the core the core can be considered as a non viscous uh, region inviscid region why because you know from the uh, theory of boundary layers that the viscous effects are confined within the boundary layer above the boundary layer you can treat as though your fluid is not viscous okay uh, since that is uh, what uh, is the underlying principle of a boundary layer here uh, when both boundary layers merge with each other so the entire cross section is now under the effect of viscosity okay it can be observed that the flow velocity is uniform in the core of the flow obviously but core velocity is not equal to u infinity so as we already pointed out it actually increases uh, along the x direction the core velocity increases okay 
in the region before the flow becomes fully developed the center line velocity is a function of x obviously you saw that with increasing x you saw that the uc the center line velocity also uh, increased but when the flow becomes fully developed you can see that u is no longer a function of x so this is a very very important result that you can note for a hydrodynamically fully developed flow situation the velocity u after the flow becomes fully developed is no more a function of x then what is it a function of if it is not a function of x so it indirectly means that it is a function of y only it is a function of y only okay so this you have studied in fluid mechanics also uh, in your fourth semester course so now the velocity profile is also shown in the previous sketch the profile will become a, a nicely parabolic uh, profile with the velocity at the axis being the maximum velocity so if i go back and if i uh, show you in that profile that we have drawn i mean to say the velocity here will be the maximum velocity u maximum okay so this is the parabolic so it should be more smoother parabolic uh, velocity profile so after the flow becomes fully developed so in this region that is region beyond this point so you will have u as a function of y only it varies only along y and there will be no variation along the x direction so this is one very important uh, thing with regards to hydrodynamically fully developed flow okay yeah now let us slightly build up upon this uh, uh, hydrodynamically fully developed flow and let us try to uh, see what our conservation equations uh, will become okay now consider a control volume which is as shown in the figure okay so you are having pressure force uh, which is acting on both sides so the control volume along uh, x the thickness of the control volume is dx so by taylor series expansion you can write this expression you already know okay the variation of pressure along the y direction is negligible so uh, pressure is taken as a function of x only and the wall shear stress so this this will represent the pressure will represent the inertial forces and uh, the viscous forces are represented by the wall shear stress so here p uh, from now onwards p is the perimeter p is the perimeter perimeter then what is a in, uh, p into dx in this case it represents the surface area so very important okay from uh, now onwards i will be using this uh, frequently okay perimeter into dx will represent uh, the surface area so now tau w into the surface area what is this actually this is the viscous force which is opposing the movement of your fluid along the x direction okay now let us bring in our continuity equations so for steady flow conditions um, you know that uh, uh, dou u by dou x plus dou v by dou y will become equal to zero okay that will be your continuity equation in two dimensions now since u is a function of y only so alternately uh, alternately put u is a function of y only so if you take the partial differential of u with respect to x obviously this will become zero because u is a function of y okay so then dou v by dou y equals zero this is very interesting so if dou v by dou y equals zero the meaning is v is no more a function of y so the velocity component along the y direction v is not a function of y anymore then what is its value so since if you consider our channel now if i take any cross section since v is not varying along y so if the value of v is equal to 0 at the wall you can say that the value of v is 0 everywhere why because you know that it does not change with y so if i measure v here here it doesn't matter so because v is not a function of y 
So the obvious conclusion that you can draw is if it is zero at some point along the y direction, so it will be zero everywhere. So that is uh, the logic that is used here. So v is also zero. Okay. Now, what happens to the acceleration term? So in the acceleration term along x, so you will have this uh, dou u by dou t term also. Since it is steady, so this term will become zero. Uh, dou uh, v is zero. So this is also zero. Uh, dou u by dou x is also zero. So you get a very interesting result. So area uh, acceleration along x is zero. So for a hydrodynamically fully developed flow situation, uh, the acceleration will become zero. So that means that the flow is a non-accelerating flow. Uh, there are no inertial forces. The flow is only because of the pressure gradient. So this is very important result. So a hydrodynamically fully developed flow is a pressure driven flow. It is of non-accelerating type. And here the pressure forces are balanced by your viscous forces. So that's it. Okay. This is a very important result to note. Let me erase this. Okay. Now proceeding further. Yeah. Now let us uh, write an expression for wall shear stress. Uh, you know wall shear stress opposes the movement of flow. Uh, this is the uh, pressure force on the right hand side minus pressure force on the left hand side. Okay, you will end up with this. Uh, A is the cross sectional area uh, of flow. So tau W will become minus A by P dou X, uh, dou P by dou X. Now, what is the value of this uh, wall shear stress? So from Newton's law of viscosity, you know that tau W is mu into du by dy. Since u is a function of y only, this du by dy obviously will become a constant will become a constant. So since tau w is a constant, this term, what is the term? Minus, sorry, minus a by p, dou p by dou x is also a constant. Now for a given pipe, given cross section, area of flow is constant and perimeter is also constant, which means dou p by dou x is a constant. So this is very, very important. So if you plot the uh, variation of pressure, so if you take, um, sorry, if you take a, if you take your pipe and if you want to plot the variation of, so let's say the flow becomes fully developed at this point, hydrodynamically fully developed that is, the variation of pressure will be like this. Initially it will be decreasing in the region before it becomes fully developed then it will become linear. So this is linear. This is the variation of pressure with x. Okay, this is very important for hydrodynamically fully developed flow. Now what are the takeaways of this discussion on hydrodynamically fully developed flow? One, one is when the flow becomes fully developed, so your velocity u is not a function of x anymore. It is a function of y only. And the flow becomes a non-accelerating type of flow. So there are no inertial uh, forces. So it cannot accelerate. And the wall shear stress will become a constant. And the pressure gradient along the x direction is a constant. So the flow is only driven by the pressure gradient along the x direction. So these are the important points that you should note with regards to hydrodynamically fully developed flow. Okay. Now let us proceed further. Now let us move on to the move on to our interest. So which is the heat transfer studies. So let us look into a, what is referred to as a thermally fully developed flow. Okay. So similar to the development of velocity boundary layer, you can also have the development of a thermal boundary layer on uh, top of the two plates that we are uh, that we had discussed in the previous section. So it, it is exactly similar to that, and a region. Uh, uh, a point will be reached along the direction x after which both your uh, thermal boundary layers merge and this uh, point onwards the flow is 
referred to as a thermally fully developed flow. So the concept is somewhat uh, analogous to uh, the velocity concept only. Okay. Here also you do not have anything uh, which is called as a, a free stream temperature or T infinity. So here the core temperature similar to core velocity will be changing continuously. And uh, uh, due to the nature of the flow again T infinity cannot be taken up as the reference temperature. So you need to define a new reference temperature so which is represented here in the equation below. So what is this equation actually? This is nothing but the wall heat flux Qw is h into Tm minus Tw. What is this Tm? So this is the reference temperature that we will be using. This is called as the bulk mean temperature. Very, very important. So this is a very important concept for internal flow uh, force convection. Okay. So what is this Tm or why is, uh, what is the origin of this? If you take the development of the thermal boundary layer, so you can draw a similar uh, profile like this. If you take a section here, let us say, I will be considering a section here. And if I, if this is the wall temperature Tw, if I want to calculate Qw, so I, re I need I know the wall temperature, but I need some temperature. So you can see that the temperature varies along the cross section. Wherever you measure, you have a different temperature. Now, this means that the temperature anywhere is a function of both coordinates, x and y. So you have the variation of temperature along the y direction also. So what can be done is instead of going with this temperature what I can do is I can take an average I can take a average temperature for the cross section I can consider an average temperature for the uh, cross section and this average is not a very simple average that we are speaking we have to consider the effect of velocity also the velocity effect should also be considered because without that you you this is not a convection problem at all. So bringing in the velocity effects along with uh, uh, the uh, what is this actually? How am I converting this? So if you calculate the energy of the fluid that is being uh, considered in this cross section, the thermal energy that is being transported. Okay. Now I should define a new temperature which is such that if you take the entire cross section and if you calculate the thermal energy again at that particular temperature, I should get the same value. So I should conserve the energy that is being transported. When that is the case, you can uh, consider the temperature as the mean, bulk mean temperature. And this is a function of X only. Tm is a function of X only, which means effectively your uh, two dimensional variation can be reduced to a, a single uh, dimension. So this is one very big advantage that uh, your mean temperature definition will bring. Now let us define this properly or how to calculate this mean temperature. Let us have a look into that. Let me erase this. So the bulk mean temperature is weighed with velocity as I uh, already mentioned. So it is given by an integral of m c p t divided by an integral of m dot into c p. Okay. So how, how did I write this? So for an incompressible fluid, enthalpy is nothing but c p into t. Okay. So m dot c p t, so I have taken in uh, uh, both numerator and denominator. So you can express the mass flow rate. So if you consider a very small elemental area along the uh, flow. So if this is the uh, condition. If I consider a small elemental area, dA, and I call it as dA, and flow is passing through this uh, dA. So you can write the mass flow rate as rho along x, that is rho u d into a. 
rho u d d a so this is please take it as d a differential area not some uh, <laughs> d into area or something like that sorry i should have left a space here so this is d a what is d a d a is a small area uh, along the cross section through which your flow is actually passing through okay now if you do the integration so you will obtain the uh, mean temperature now here say uh, we have removed rho and cp assuming that they are constant so for incompressible flow rho is a constant uh, so incompressible fluid and cp we are assuming it uh, as a co constant uh, property uh, situation so cp will also be removed now let us quickly uh, do a order of magnitude scaling uh, analysis let us see what uh, will yield so what is this this is q equals uh, h into delta t what is delta t here please be aware this is tm minus tw so this is from the previous slide i am taking so k into delta t by same both are same uh, by uh, delta along y direction okay which is nothing but delta t which is the thermal boundary layer thickness so the order of magnitude is 1 so the order of magnitude is 1 does not mean that delta t is a constant so it can be a function of y okay so let us see what happens when the boundary layers merge okay so a very interesting thing actually happens when both the boundary layers merge okay you can see that the boundary layer thickness is now a constant why because we have these two parallel plates the distance separating the plate is 2h this is the center line now if two boundary layers merge what is the thickness of the boundary layer after merging so this is delta t so delta t is equal to h okay so now delta t is a constant it is not a function of uh, anything okay so it is a constant now so h into h so if i substitute that here h into h will become constant so that is what is this actually this is the definition of nusselt number so nusselt number is a constant so this is the major uh, conclusion that you can draw from the analysis of the thermal boundary layer for fully developed situation what is that the nusselt number reaches a constant value so whenever you have a thermally fully developed flow your nusselt number is constant so this is the uh, conclusion of the discussion that we are having okay so when we derive the expression or when we derive uh, for nusselt number so we should actually get the value as a constant so that is the meaning of uh, this entire thing okay so now let us continue our discussion and see uh, what we can extract okay so now let us use a non-dimensional temperature definition so if you recall for uh, external flow situations we had done the same thing so what was different there for an external flow uh, situation so you took theta as t minus tw so this was same so instead of tm you took it as t infinity the free stream velocity was your reference uh, temperature but here it is replaced by the bulk mean temperature okay now if you use if you incorporate this in the qw equals uh, h um, tm minus tw expression so you will get this this is easily obtainable okay since h by k is not a function of x as pre as in the previous slide we have discussed uh, because it is a constant so it is not a function of x so theta is also not a function of x very 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 important uh, conclusion okay so therefore what is your final conclusion theta the non-dimensional temperature for a fully developed situation is not a function of x then what is it a function of it is a function of y so this is the conclusion that you can draw for a thermally fully developed flow situation so it is also interesting to note that the temperature t at any point in the flow is not uh, uh, a function of x only it is a function of both x and y 
so if you take a cross section so it will vary along x uh, along y direction also the absolute temperature that we are uh, considering here so if you take but if you take the non dimensional temperature though it is a function of y only it is a function of y only okay so this is one uh, very important conclusion that you can draw so if you want to summarize uh, about the thermal uh, thermally fully developed flow situation so what are the results you are getting the non dimensional temperature theta is not a function of x okay this is one uh, major conclusion and the other major conclusion is the nusselt number will become a constant the nusselt number will become a constant actually if you plot the variation of nusselt number so before uh, at the start of the flow so if you consider here so you you know that the boundary layer is very thin here so which means here you will have a very high heat transfer coefficient okay so that means if you plot the variation of your nusselt number with x so you will find the variation to be like this so this is the constant value this is the fully developed uh, flow the situation okay so this is one observation that you can also make yeah now in engineering applications there are two important uh, boundary conditions that you will frequently come across one is called the constant wall temperature uh, boundary condition wherein the walls will be maintained at a constant temperature the other one is uh, referred to as the constant wall heat flux boundary condition so these are the two boundary conditions that we will be considering uh, in the analysis of internal flow problems for constant wall temperature uh, boundary condition so you can see so i have used the non dimensional definition of temperature theta so i have rearranged and i have differentiated with respect to x you know that for a fully developed uh, flow situation theta is a function of y so uh, d theta by dx is obviously zero so this entire term will get eliminated so do t by do x equals theta into dtm by dx this is a very important result uh, we will be using this result later when we start derivation of the nusselt number for a constant wall temperature uh, situation okay please remember for constant wall temperature situation do t by do x is theta into dtm by dx okay now let us go to the other boundary condition which is constant wall heat flux uh, boundary condition so as the condition implies so qw that is the wall heat flux is a constant now so qw is equal to constant again let us uh, start with the non dimensional temperature theta okay rearrange it and differentiate with respect to x i have used the product rule on the rhs for a thermally fully developed flow again uh, d theta by dx is zero so this term will automatically get eliminated so you will be left with these two terms on the uh, left hand side and theta into uh, dtm by dx minus dtw by dx on the rhs let us further simplify this by considering the definition of qw which is h into tw minus tm okay so you know if you now differentiate this with respect to x since qw is a constant for this uh, case so it is zero so again using product rule uh, we have differentiated now for a thermally fully developed flow we noted that h by k is a constant earlier okay now if the thermal conductivity of the fluid is constant if k is equal to constant obviously h is also a constant h is also a constant so therefore if you invoke this condition above in this expression so dh by dx will become zero so you will find that dtw by dx equals dtm by dx very very important and also from the previous slide you can see the do t by do x is also equal to uh, dtw by dx and by these two equations you can conclude that all the three are same and they are a constant so they will be a constant because when you equate these three so 
obviously logically they can be they, they should be a constant okay so this is one very important result so which we will be needing uh, while we derive the natural number expression okay so now for thermally fully developed flow situation with constant wall temperature boundary condition dou t by dou x is theta into dtm by dx for constant wall heat flux boundary condition uh, it will become dou t by dou x equals dtm by dx which is same as dtw by dx okay now in both cases if you observe so you have this dtm by dx feature so it will be useful if we can get an expression to calculate this dtm by dx so that is what we will do in the next slides now okay now consider a overall energy balance so this is a overall energy balance and this is not for a constant wall heat flux or a constant wall temperature this is applicable for a general situation so we are just equating the energies here so if you see the terms involved uh, in this uh, sketch up that we have drawn so you can see that there are no conduction terms actually we have assumed that there is negligible heat conduction in the axial direction so this is a major assumption that we are bringing in so along the x axis we are assuming that there is no heat conduction so is this absolutely true may not be there may there might be some conduction but when you compare it with the advection due to the flow of the fluid so it is negligibly small so this is how we will uh, put it okay so assuming negligible heat conduction in the axial direction so you will only have uh, the heat transfer due to flow which is represented by mcpt okay and if you if there is some wall uh, heat flux qw so you can estimate how much uh, the rate of heat transfer as qw into surface area ptx so same thing is uh, done here okay ultimately you will get this very important expression to calculate dtm by dx which is wall heat flux into perimeter by mass flow rate into cp okay so this is the expression that you can get by overall energy balance and this is applicable for both the boundary conditions that we have considered which is constant wall heat flux and constant wall temperature okay yeah now let us see what is the implication uh, of the expressions that we have got uh, for constant wall heat flux boundary condition so for constant wall heat flux uh, mean temperature varies linearly with x okay from the start of the channel why because if you go back and see this expression so qw is a constant qw is a constant here for constant wall heat flux boundary condition so this entire thing will become a constant uh, value so dtm by dx is constant irrespective of whether the flow is fully developed or not okay so that's why dtm is represented by a linear line as it is shown here is represented by a linear line okay since dtm by dx is same as dtw by dx in the thermally full this is applicable please uh, remember so this expression what we have uh, written here is applicable applicable only in thermally fully developed a uh, flow region okay this is not applicable in the region which is uh, before the flow becomes fully thermally fully developed okay so in this region you can see that the variation is not uh, linear so after this it will become linear and the slope should be same because these two are same so uh, they will become parallel lines okay so this is how the wall temperature and the mean temperature Uh, vary for a constant wall heat flux uh, situation now similarly if you consider the same thing for the constant wall temperature so you get some interesting results there also okay so for constant wall temperature uh, we have again quoted the result that we have obtained by overall uh, energy balance 
so if we introduce this uh, tw minus tm uh, since tw is a constant it will not change anything so it will not change anything it will not disturb any uh, balance here so if you take the length of the channel so if i take the length of the channel as l so if this is the channel length okay this is x equals 0 this is x equals l now if i take a situation which is like this you you can see that you will get a logarithmic uh, term on the lhs you have a log term so and this is to be integrated between x equals 0 and x equals l okay in the rhs so h into dx is nothing but h bar the average heat transfer coefficient the average heat transfer coefficient p into l perimeter into length is the overall surface area that you are having divided by m dot cp so you know that q is m dot cp change in temperature at x equals l and change in temperature at x equals 0 minus change in temperature at x equals 0 so how did i write this so this is nothing but tw by tm minus tw uh, plus tm sorry minus of tw minus tm sorry i'll erase it at x equals l minus the same thing at x equal to 0 so you get this uh, term on the right hand side and this is called as lmtd what is lmtd so it is a short form of log mean temperature difference which is very important concept for constant wall temperature log mean temperature difference so which means to say so the difference in temperature of the fluid inside and the wall uh, when the wall temperature is constant is not a, a linear variation it is a variation which is exponential in nature so you can see an exponential variation and the temperature mean temperature approaches the wall temperature asymptotically asymptotically and uh, uh, th this is the result that you get when you invoke the constant wall temperature situation so a lot of uh, discussion will happen with regards to log mean temperature difference in the next module that is in module 4 which is heat exchangers there you will uh, study about this in a elaborate way and also you will solve many numericals based on this okay please note the log mean temperature difference and the origin of it why is it uh, featuring okay So let us conclude uh, uh, this lecture session uh, uh, with this uh, at this point in lecture session 7 so we can take up uh, uh, the actual derivation of uh, the Nusselt number uh, for uh, flow between parallel plates and also flow in circular uh, pipes so what we have discussed today let us uh, let me quickly summarize we have discussed the concept of fully developed flow so we started with hydrodynamically fully developed flow which was pertaining to the uh, velocity boundary layer so we noted that for when the flow becomes hydrodynamically fully developed so the velocity u is not a function of x anymore and it's a function of y only we also noted that uh, it is a non accelerating flow and it is driven only by the pressure uh, change and shear stress will also reach a constant value and also the pressure gradient is a constant okay and then we ventured into discussion of thermally fully developed flow we saw that for a thermally fully developed flow the non-dimensional temperature theta is a function of y only it is not a function of x and also we defined a new reference temperature which we called as bulk mean uh, temperature which represents the average temperature 
at a given cross section and it's a function of x only okay later we considered um, uh, the <coughs> later when we did is order of scaling analysis and we order of magnitude analysis we observed that the Nusselt number for a thermally fully developed flow situation will become a constant so which was the major conclusion that we drew from the thermally fully developed flow situation uh, we took up two uh, boundary conditions one is constant wall heat flux boundary condition the other one is constant wall temperature boundary condition and we saw what uh, simplification that the situation of fully developed flow a thermally fully developed flow that is will bring into these two uh, cases and we also noted the variation dtm by dx and we plotted the variation of mean temperature with respect to wall temperature so this was uh, what was done in today's class and please remember all the analysis that we are doing uh, invariably assumes that the flow is laminar so you don't have any analytical discussion that we can do or analytical derivation that we can do for turbulent flow so the turbulent flow is all empirical uh, relationships and whatever analysis that we are doing assumes that the flow is laminar only so please remember that and don't confuse uh, that uh, we are discussing turbulent flow and not okay so with this let me end today's lecture let us meet in the lecture session 7 thank you